you might recognize this image. This, it's a Paul Kane's painting of uh, Fort Edmonton, or as the Hudson's Bay Company called it, Edmonton House, in the year 1846 when he visited. By that time, 1846, Edmonton had been a settled community for half a century, and it was the headquarters and the hub of an extraordinary uh, system of trade and communications that connected three oceans, the Atlantic Ocean by way of Hudson's Bay, the Arctic Ocean uh, at the mouth of the Mackenzie River, and uh, the Pacific by way of, uh, of the uh, Columbia River. What I'm gonna talk about for the next few minutes is how this happened and why it persisted and allowed Edmonton to develop into the northernmost large city in North America and one of the very few this far north in the world. It starts, of course, with our river just outside the door there, the North Saskatchewan. The Saskatchewan was the great highway of the Western interior for the First Nations from the time it took uh, shape at the end of the last ice age. On it, canoes could travel unobstructed from the Rockies to Lake Winnipeg, and from there along the Nelson River to uh, the, uh, the shores of Hudson's Bay where the uh, uh, Hudson's Bay Company's York factory was. The river provided fish and its shores in places had gravel deposits that, uh, with the kinds of stone that uh, were useful for making tools and implements. Um, once the Hudson's Bay Company set up operations at York Factory and Churchill fa Factory on Hudson Bay, the Cree traveled down the Saskatchewan and Nelson rivers with their furs to trade. None of the First Nations in this part of the world found it necessary to establish permanent or semi-permanent settlements at any particular place along the whole length of the river before the fur trade started. In the 1740s, European fur traders began to identify the importance of the river as the essential route west and the source of beaver pelts. There is what the Hudson's Bay Company called a made beaver, a beaver pelt uh, prepared, ready to be packed into 90 pound bales to be shipped back to uh, Britain. Beaver were the economic driver of the fur trade because their dense oily fur was um, ideal for making felt. And the felt in turn was made into beaver hats, which were essential fashion items for European gentlemen for centuries, up to really the late 19th century. If you look at a vegetation map of uh, of the, this part of the world. You can see this area here, the turquoise area, which is the Aspen Parkland region. South of it is uh, uh, open prairie, north of its boreal forest. Uh, parkland is important because it's very good beaver habitat, and it is also good bison habitat, particularly in the winter. The bison uh, tended to migrate north from the uh, prairies in the winter in search of shelter, and uh, that meant that you could make a living in those parts of the world. The prairie, um, it's, it's essentially uh, has no beaver worth mentioning, it's cert certainly not worth uh, exploiting. And, and of course, our river here actually parallels and, and forms the northern boundary of the, uh, of the Asp Aspen Parkland for much of its length. Uh, the, the French pushing west 
from Lake Superior and north up the Red River, established posts on Lake Winnipeg and uh, the easternmost parts of the uh, North Saskatchewan. That threatened to cut off the flow of uh, furs to, the, to, the, uh, to Hudson's Bay. So the Hudson's Bay Company sent Anthony Henday west in 1754 to check out what was happening. His reports clearly showed the vital importance of the river, but war between England and France, which was going on at the time, put any efforts to exploit the opportunity on hold until 1763. The English takeover of Montreal, of Quebec, from the French in 1763 energized the Montreal fur, trail, fur trade because uh, the Montreal traders now had access to much superior Atlantic shipping and better quality man manufactured goods to trade. And a new organization headquartered in Montreal called the Northwest Company quickly emerged. Both the Hudson's Bay Company and the Northwest Company now began to build posts west along uh, the North Saskatchewan. By the future site of uh, Edmonton House in 1795, and eventually as far west as Rocky Mountain House. The two companies, although they were competitors, often built their posts side by side, to keep, mostly to keep a close eye on the competition and uh, figure out what, what they were doing. But the competition uh, often also involved intimidation and even murder. This was particularly true when both companies discovered the other river in the region, the Athabasca, which parallels the North Saskatchewan uh, from the mountains to just north of Edmonton. The Athabasca runs north uh, to the huge Lake Athabasca and then to Great Slave Lake, where it connects to the Mackenzie all the way to the Arctic. This route is through boreal forest almost all the way. And boreal for forest is even better be beaver habitat than uh, uh, the parkland region. At Lake Athabasca, the Athabasca joins the Peace River coming in from the west. And it forms an enormous delta there, the Peace, Peace uh, Athabasca. Delta, which is like the center of the beaver universe. It was the, the, uh, 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 the, best, the best center of the world as far as beaver were concerned. So exploiting this opportunity involved a couple of serious problems. First of all, getting from the North Saskatchewan watershed over to the Athabasca watershed was not easy. The most direct route uh, into the Athabasca country uh, is if you leave the North Saskatchewan just before it flows into uh, uh, Lake Winnipeg and head northwest through a chain of lakes uh, that will get you to the Clearwater River, which is a tributary of the Athabasca and, and flows down into there. A lot of difficult portages. It turns out that actually the easier route is to go all the way west about where Edmonton is. And uh, if you get there, you can follow an overland route, a fairly easy overland route. It's about 130 kilometers, uh, but uh, it's much easier than uh, the alternative routes, and it uh, uh, joins the uh, Athabasca at Fort Assiniboine. Uh, and, as you, and as you can see from the vegetation map, part of that area is that there's a little northern spur of the Aspen Parkland there, uh, which, which also helps. The Hudson's Bay Company maintained a large herd of horses 
uh, at Edmonton House uh, for uh, uh, tr uh, transportation back and forth to uh, Fort Assiniboine. Second big problem about maintaining the bo uh, posts in, in the bore uh, boreal forest was the relative scarcity of large game animals. There aren't enough moose and deer uh, in those areas to, su to sustain life in any one place over the winter. Several early attempts to set up posts uh, on the Athabasca resulted in traders starving to death over the, uh, over the winter. The solution to this problem was uh, dried bison meat and fat made into pemmican, packaged into the 90-pound bags that were the standard weight in the Hudson's Bay Company transportation system. And they were uh, an excellent solution to this problem. They're energy dense, uh, they're long lasting, and they're readily available in the, uh, in the regions south of, south of Edmonton, especially down on the prairies here. Initially, the company bought uh, pemmican from the Blackfoot and uh, uh, other Plains nations, but this role was increasingly taken over by the Métis, who uh, uh, came, came to dominate the, uh, the pemmican trade, and uh, the, the pemmican trade actually had uh, everything to do with their emergence as a distinct people. So all the factors favoring Edmonton come together as the key location in the Western fur trade by about 1799 when James Byrd was uh, appointed chief factor uh, at Edmonton House. In 1821, the British government stepped in and forced a merger between the two fur companies, the Hudson's Bay Company and the Northwest Company. Uh, and the new combined company, uh, which was put under the uh, uh, administration of this guy, George Simpson, uh, confirmed Edmonton as the key position in, uh, in Western Canada. Simpson looks like sort of a benign uh, early Victorian gentleman. Uh, he wasn't. He, he was an exceedingly hard-nosed uh, businessman. If he'd been around alive today, he would certainly have been an MBA. <laughs> the merger of the two companies meant that the Hudson's Bay Company also took over the Northwest Company operations on the Pacific Coast. They were already out to the Pacific Coast uh, well before 1821. They had uh, two important uh, posts at, near the mouth of the Columbia River, uh, Fort Astoria and Fort Vancouver, and uh, the Hudson's Bay Company started moving up north to the uh, Vancouver Island and the uh, lower Fraser Valley as well. The most valuable trade here was in sea otter pelts to China by way of Hawaii. The Hudson's Bay Company had uh, a post at Lahaina on Maui, uh, which was uh, uh, an essential route. They, that was where they recruited most of their the, the seamen for their ships back and forth across the Pacific. So what linked the whole network that stretched from London on the one end to Hudson's Bay, here up to the Arctic, west coast, Hawaii, China, is Edmonton. <laughs> the Hudson's Bay Company had a special unit called the Columbia Brigade that ran a regular uh, courier service between York Factory on Hudson's Bay and the Pacific and back again. The, the painting by Peter Rindisbacher uh, gives you a pretty good idea of what the, Hudson, or what the Columbia Gra Brigade looked at. Very, very much an elite group. They've got the Hudson's Bay Company flag lying on the uh, canoe. The steersman's got a very fancy beaver hat, and several of the other uh, uh, boatmen have 
uh, beaver hats as well. Um, if you visit Fort Edmonton, uh, you will see a building. It's a separate building. It's in behind the main building, way away, as far away as possible from the other uh, uh, residential parts of the uh, uh, of the fort, which housed the Columbia Brigade when they were in town. Uh, they were considered to be a bad influence on the uh, on the other. Oh, inc incidentally, Rindisbacher paints this in 1823 when he was living at Red River. What he calls Canadians here are who, what we would call Métis. When I was uh, teaching this subject at U of A, it took most of a semester. So I've obviously <laughs> <laughs> left a few details out here. If you're interested in looking up this subject uh, further, the Historical Society of Alberta has published the Edmonton House journals and correspondence from 1806 to 1826 in a couple of recent volumes. That's it. <laughs>